Welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Rashid. And I'm Jill Wine Banks. And today's hashtag, Jill's Pin, is the Liberty Bell because we're going to be talking about what the role of the press in democracy is. And I think the First Amendment is the First Amendment for a reason. It is essential to democracy and liberty. Our democracy is being tested like it never has been before. More and more Republicans appear untethered to reality, seamlessly spreading lies, unable to govern, and taking more extreme positions. Meanwhile, the Democrats couldn't be more different. Whatever criticism you might have of them, they are at least a serious political party, voting for the same speaker candidate time and time again and signing into law important policies that benefit all Americans, not just Democrats and Republicans. Yet the media still has a tendency to treat the parties as if they're the same. They spend a lot of time talking about President Biden's age, but not much time talking about his opponent's age, who is just three years younger. So today we are going to talk about what the media must do ahead of 2024, and especially at this moment in our democracy when the media's role has never been more important. And we'll look at what they should have learned from the last couple of presidential elections. And to help us answer all of these very important questions, we have with us today someone who is terrific for that. His name is John Harwood. He is a very respected and esteemed journalist. Most recently, John was um, served as White House correspondent for CNN. And before CNN, he was editor-at-large for CNBC, the chief White House correspondent for CNBC and a contributor to the New York Times. We are very thrilled to have you with us today, John. Welcome. You and I go back to a time when the media all shared the same facts. There was no debate about facts. There was debate about the policy implications of facts. That is obviously no longer the case right now. So let's start by talking about the current media landscape and what it hasn't learned from past elections. What do you think the media got wrong in 2016 and in 2020? And what should they do to correct it in 2024? Well, Jill, let me start by just making a comment on your initial observation. Um, back when you were a Watergate prosecutor, and my dad was a uh, a major editor at the Washington Post, um, there was debate about what the um, uh, mainstream press was um, uh, publishing, but there weren't many alternatives to it. Um, I remember a time when uh, Pat Buchanan was a uh, an aide to the Nixon White House, and my dad was the first ombudsman at the Washington Post, designed to evaluate the complaints that what they what the Nixon White House called the Eastern Liberal Press was out to get them. And Dad and Pat Buchanan had a debate at the Kennedy Center, uh, talking about you know what the press did right and what the press did wrong. And Pat was making the argument that you know it was this huge force that was um, uh, uh, holding down Republicans and uh, uh, trying to lift up Democrats. And my dad made the observation, well, if the, if the press is so powerful and it's holding down Republic, Republicans, how come Republicans are winning the presidential elections right now? You guys just want a landslide victory. Um, what has happened since is that those complaints have gotten louder but also an infrastructure has developed a, a conservative uh, media ecosystem to compete with uh, the mainstream press. And so what you have is a sharply ideological formed for a political purpose, uh, uh, conservative press led by Fox News, started by Roger Ailes, who was a Republican political consultant. Um, and then a uh, mainstream press that's trying to um, uh, do the job the way it always did. And that stratification has produced a, a weird disjunction in our politics where the, the right wing press is constantly cheerleading for their side. And the mainstream press is trying to cover uh, on a on a uh, reasonably objective basis, realizing we all have our biases and all that, uh, but but trying to um, do the the traditional scrutiny. And it has created a huge imbalance. Um, then you have the influence of technology, which has fragmented all the audiences and has left all of us in the news business 
scrapping for eyeballs and um, uh, uh, attention, time uh, focused on the products that we put out, uh, many of which are available for free on the internet. So you lose the financial basis for paying for news gathering. And it's just a very, very tough situation. So among the pressures that people in the media face are to not alienate segments of their audience that might help sustain them financially. And so you have a significant uh, number of uh, mainstream reporters who are operating in the old environment and thinking, well, I've got to uh, frame disputes as, you know, one side says this and the other side says that. And if you if you look at one, what one side is saying and recognize that it's bullshit or not true, you feel in some people feel inhibited from saying so. And that's a that's a bit of a challenge. And I think it gets to yeah. perhaps what you were alluding to about the lessons that were learned from past campaigns. Um, I, I think the press has done a pretty good job overall in covering let's say Donald Trump, even in 2016 when he rose, but it's a, it, this is now flowered into a huge threat to our democracy that I think raises the bar for the press to describe what actually is happening and what are the stakes. And that's a difficult thing to do if you're accustomed to thinking of, well, there's two political parties, they disagree, and uh, then we'll have these good faith arguments and um, the voters will sort it out. Uh, there's a lot of arguments that are not good faith arguments being put uh, forward for purposes that I think we as journalists have to call out. That is for sure. So in that, yeah, I mean, in that same vein, I mean, you have not been shy about calling out the dangerous moment we're in, um, in our democracy, but to your point, it feels like not many journalists call out in the same way that you have done so. So I'm wondering, do you think this is because like, why is that happening? Is it because journalists think it's too partisan or too subjective? And if so, what would your response be to that? Well, I think there's a variety of reasons for it. Uh, one is there's a financial imperative for news organizations to remain viable and to attract the largest possible audience and to avoid um, alienating uh, potential uh, paying customers. That's one. Second of all, there is an ethic that people in the mainstream press try to follow of fairness and objectivity. And I, I say objectivity, recognizing, as I indicated earlier, there's no perfect objectivity. We're all influenced by our life experiences and the place where we grow up and the people we grow up around. And um, so everybody has points of view, but the, the mainstream press tries to temper those in the interests of giving audience audiences a choice. Uh, so that's the second thing. The third thing is that because of the first two, many people, particularly younger people uh, who are starting out in the business, uh, who may not be in a uh, uh, position of feeling confident enough to draw sharp conclusions, may sort of combine that inherent caution with concern about their their futures and the futures of their news organizations to um to adopt a sort of least common denominator description of events. It's easier for me, you know, I'm 66 years old. I've been doing this a long time. As I've gotten further in my career, it has occurred to me that the only point of continuing to do this work is if I can share what I've learned, you know, wisdom, experience, whatever, uh, that gives me the confidence to say, I see this uh, pattern, I see this set of events, and I know what it is, and I'm going to describe it that way. And the consequences when you when you get older are just less. You know, the the uh, ninety five percent of my career is behind me. That's fine. I don't care. Um, if I can't call it the way I see it, I'd rather not do the work. So, um, so it's a different set of calculations if you're a twenty eight year old or thirty five year old um, reporter at whatever outlet, print or uh, uh, online or uh, television uh, to, you know, the, the stakes are higher for uh, blunt talk. And, and that's, I think, uh, an important factor. Because the show is intergenerational and there are um, younger listeners who, I don't know, could be journalism majors or are starting off in the journalism industry, what would you say to those 25, 26-year-olds who are just starting out and who feel like maybe they can't speak up in that way? Do you suggest that they 
do it? Well, yes, because I think that people starting their careers um, are taking this uh, shifting landscape for granted. Um, the media infrastructure is adapting to this uh, new world. And so you have different outlets uh, that are um, being created. You know, the, the cost of entry uh, given technology is very low. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we've seen happen in many cities is that uh, existing daily newspapers, which have this huge sunk cost and, you know, printing copies and distributing them, um, uh, uh, that's a, that's a huge financial problem for them to to try to uh, deal with. But if you're forming a digital publication, there's nothing of that. You you the space is infinite, and as long as you can um, develop enough revenue to pay people to uh, produce news, if you're producing news that is valuable to people, they'll consume it. So um, no, I think people have to uh, follow their heart and their instincts and their intellect to see the world as it is and try to describe it. And um, and I think a, a younger generation talking to a younger generation will have a way of not uh, erasing divisions, but coping with them, managing them and um, uh, uh, communicating in ways that they can get uh, people their age to recognize and, and um, uh, 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 savor the the shared values they have, and and that can be the basis of a successful news organization. And, and in terms of news organizations, and what we see now, you know, print newspapers, magazines, digital online platforms, and streaming. Do you think that what we have now is going to continue going forward? Do you think that your grandchildren are going to read a newspaper? Do you think? Victor's generation is going to watch television. Is cable going to even survive? I, I don't think so. I think it's going to be vastly different. I mean, I consider the newspaper where I started out when I got out of college in 1978 was a very high quality, um, uh, but medium sized metropolitan newspaper in St. Petersburg, Florida called the St. Petersburg Times. Um, many, many people who went on to work for the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal came out of that newspaper. Um, at, its, at its peak, it circulated uh, a half a million copies on Sunday. Um, it, it distributed um, in selected places all over the state. Um, and it was, it was woven into the fabric of, of uh, city of St. Petersburg and Tampa Bay. Now I believe it publishes in print one day a week only on Sunday. Um, and that is true of many, many places. None of my children subscribe to, you know, my daughters are all grown 26, 30, and 34. None of them subscribe to a daily print newspaper. None of them subscribe to cable television. They get their news in other ways. There's social media. There, there are ways in which they can access through streaming services. Some of the things that we recognize, they can, you know, get a, get a live, football game or they can get a live newscast if they need to, but that's, it's not, it's not um, assumed and customary in their lives. And I think that's going to continue. And so, you know, these little devices, which we walk around with all the time, I think that's going to be the primary conduit. Um, and, and I think uh, the world that, uh, you know, Jill and I have you know lived our adult lives in is simply not going to exist by the time my, you know, grandchild is, you know, a college graduate. I think the thing that worries me the most is that there's no vetting of the information that's perpetrated or broadcast or put forth on social media and that anybody can say anything and it's then often believed if it's repeated and it gets rebroadcast through people retweeting something or rethreading something. And we have no way of knowing whether anything is true anymore. At, are your children at all concerned about that? Yes, um, and, and I and I'm concerned about it as well. And th this is one of the signal differences. You know, in some ways, my career has followed the career that my dad had. He started at regional newspapers in Nashville, Tennessee, and Louisville, Kentucky. Then he came to Washington and worked for the Washington Post, and was the national editor of the Post during the Watergate period when 
Jill was uh, playing such an instrumental role in in um, uh, that Watergate scandal and it's uh, uh, how it turned out. Um, he had in his time, I think, a much greater influence on public events than I have in my time, even though I've worked for big national news organizations, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, CNN, CNBC. And I think that's because the... Um, the echo effect of what major national newspapers uh, and the the fact that there was more widespread agree uh, uh, sort of acceptance of a, a given set of facts um, uh, it simply um, if, if he wrote something in the newspaper it was like a heavy rock getting thrown into a lake and there were big waves you know I write something it's like little ripples that that happen um, and the development of the conservative media infrastructure I talked about, the polarization of the society so that you now have these highly ideological parties. We didn't grow up with parties that were ideologically uh, uh, homogenous. They were mixed up. That has created a lot of incentive for people to uh, lie and to mislead uh, their constituents, as we've seen by Donald Trump since the 2020 election, convincing people that the election was stolen from them when it, it was not. And um, the, the ability to make things that aren't true uh, believed by a substantial number of the people on your side is just very large. And I think the impact of somebody like Elon Musk taking over Twitter, which had been a, um, a very important platform for disseminating news and information, um, he has embodied the uh, refusal to accept things that uh, he doesn't want to be true and therefore lowered the guardrails against disinformation. I think it's a big problem. Artificial intelligence obviously is another element in that as well. Yeah. Yeah. That can be a whole separate discussion, but I, I wanted to go back to a point that you raised um, a, a couple of minutes ago, which is sort of your father and also your, your path into journalism, which is starting mm -hmm. off at these regional publications and then going up national with the sort of kind of disintegration of regional and local press do you feel like the quality of journalism is impacted in any ways where you have young people now going straight from undergrad to national publications without having that sort of regional and local kind of experience of how to cover things? A hundred percent. I mean, you don't have the, the kind of apprenticeship that people served at those smaller publications. First of all, the publications tend to be, uh, when they haven't disappeared altogether, tend to be shells of what they used to be much diminished staff, much uh, smaller editing ranks, um, simply a less commitment to the kind of things that we could do when I started my career. You know, wh when I got out of college, um, newspapers in most cities were monopolies. They'd ma they, they made as much money as they wanted to make. If you had a public spirited owner, they would, they would uh, plow profits back into the news gathering. And that's the fortunate situation I was in, in St. Petersburg. Others, you know, if they're publicly traded, they would they would try to return money to shareholders. But the point is, they had monopolies. If, if you were a department store or uh, an individual wanting to uh, conduct commerce, sell something, you had to use the uh, both the display advertising in the case of like you know big retailers or classified ads in the case of individuals to move that product, and so they could command a lot of money. That money is now gone. So the, um, uh, those news organizations are a shell of what they used to be. And that means, so you don't have the apprenticeship. And when you say, Victor, you know, moving to a national publication, the bar for what's a national publication has also gone way down because anybody, I could start a website tomorrow and call it the National Times of the United States. That would be in theory a national uh, news organization and anybody in the country could see it. But what does that really mean? And if I work, if somebody came to work for me at the National Times and I said, oh, I'll assign you to cover the White House, what um, what skill, uh, scrutiny, career uh, career building experience would they really get from that? And and that's a big, a big, big challenge. Yeah. Let's, let's go back to Donald Trump specifically, because mm -hmm. uh, you've been outspoken about him. You. Mm -hmm. One said that he appeared to be under deep psychological distress. Mm -hmm. and, um, you got a lot of pushback from that. Mm -hmm. yep. 
from conservatives for saying that. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you think too many journalists have feared the backlash. And so they hold back from saying the truth or the full story. Um, what do you think of that? Do you think that it's something that is holding back journalism from speaking the full truth? Sure. I mean, I think people are inhibited about that. And there's some good reasons for that inhibition. I, I have I have struggled with the right way to describe Donald Trump. And, and you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, uh, and most of my colleagues or the overwhelming majority of my colleagues are not. It is obvious to me, as a matter of common sense, there's something wrong with him. There's something unwell about him. And, you know, people say, well, he's a, he's a narcissist or he's a sociopath or, you know, whatever. I, I don't I don't know what the right description. So unwell is is my little, you know, uh, uh, catch all term to describe it. But he is clearly somebody who lacks empathy, who lacks concern about other individuals, who lacks concern about the country itself and is ex uh, uh, interested to the exclusion of everything else in what is good for him. He is he is so transactional in, to such an extreme degree that he could say, you know, the, the, the most vile thing about a person and the, the person complimented, you know, how his hair looked that day, he would he would put his arm around him and say he's his, his best friend. He's extremely responsive to those kind of stimuli. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're not a, a doctor, I mean, th there's an ethic among among uh, uh, doctors, psychiatrists in particular, not to describe a patient they haven't personally seen. Now, over time during the Trump presidency, people kind of cast that aside because his his uh, the way in which there's something wrong with him was so apparent that some of those uh, people stepped up and urged their colleagues to step up. If if people in the psychiatric profession were uncertain what to say about it, of course, journalists are going to be. I will say, I'm not sure how much difference it would make if journalists were less inhibited on that. Um, you know, the, the, his behavior is kind of obvious to the American public. He's gotten a huge amount of exposure. If a journalist puts an, a label on it, is that going to affect how somebody uh, uh, in the public responds to that, especially given the trends we're talking about of relatively small audiences. I'm not sure it would move the needle all that much. I just, for my own um, conscience, I have to call it the way I see it. Um, and, you know, I hope everyone would do that. But um, I think the, the political divisions that we have and the people that he's appealing to most closely have many, many reasons, uh, uh, sort of visceral reasons for sticking with him, no matter what his behavior is. You know, I think many of Donald Trump's supporters know that he's a liar, know that he's a con man, but they also believe that he is fighting um, on behalf of, uh, th th that he's fighting in the name of um, uh, uh, things that are significant to them, people who think that the world has changed in ways that are damaging to them, especially if you're a uh, a less educated white male um, uh, blue collar uh, uh, worker who thinks that things, ways in which they could navigate the country in the 1950s have gone away and they want somebody who talks about throwing the clock back. Uh, whatever the individual characteristics of that person, it's that cause that they're looking for. And Donald Trump is speaking out for that cause. And, you know, I, I think that's a that's a strong motivator. So, so uh, let's talk. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead, Joel. Yeah. yeah, you go ahead. I was, I was gonna say, let, let's talk about some few examples um, to kind of highlight what we're talking about here, because mm -hmm. we're currently in the midst of this very intense speakership battle, and there are many stories that try to cast blame um, for you know on it for Democrats. How should the media report these sorts of accusations, given sort of what we talked about so far? You mean accusations flying around in the speaker's race? With the speaker's race and sort of like trying to put this on Democrat shoulders and, and not, um, I guess. Well, that's absurd. I, I guess know, it, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. no, it's not on yeah. Democrat shoulders. This is a this is the sort of culmination of longstanding dysfunction within the Republican Party. 
that has resulted from a focused effort by the party to rally those people I was just talking about a few moments ago who were upset the way with the way that the world has changed. Um, they want to roll back the clock. They're mad at re the realities of 21st century life, which is the country's becoming more diverse. It's very soon going to be a majority minority country. Uh, when Donald Trump was growing up in the 1960s as a young adult, 80% of Americans were white Christians. Now it's uh, under 50%. There are people very distressed uh, by that. It's the rising status and role of women in our society. There are men who are very discomforted by that. Um, uh, all of those things have resulted in the election of a cadre of Republican elected officials who are just mad. And they're representing people who are mad. And so what results from that is not a governing agenda. They're not really interested in governing. They're interested in um, uh, shouting at the clouds that, that, you know, stop the world, I want to get off, that kind of thing. And so that's why you have a party, given that that's the dominant faction, that's not really capable of governing the country right now. Um, and that is on vivid display in the House where Kevin McCarthy... Kevin McCarthy doesn't really believe anything. He's kind of a cipher and he's been making a career in politics and trying to sort of do whatever he could to keep, you know, moving up the ladder. And he got elected a uh, speaker with a bunch of these people underneath him and he accommodated them in various ways, but he also recognized at some level that you had to keep the government open. You couldn't send the country into default. So he made these little uh, deals almost kind of they snuck up out of nowhere to to uh, raise the debt limit and to um, uh, extend government funding. And the, the angry people uh, deposed him for that. Now, are those people, if they get their way, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to bump up against reality, too. The, the, they rail about spending uh, and deficits, but. The spending and deficits largely come from Social Security, Social Security, and Medicare, which their own constituents like. And so th there is no there is no formula by which they're going to say, OK, now we're in charge and I'm going to we're going to make the, the government and the country like we want it. It's not going to work. And and uh, so instead, you have this kind of impotent, you know, fighting and, you know, uh, squabbling with people vetoing one candidate after the other. Don't know how it's going to come out. And and what can the press do to get the facts out? Because that's one of the concerns that Victor and I have long had, mm -hmm. is that the things that I consider facts based on evidence, based on documents, based on reality, are just not getting through. You have the Donald Trump contingent believing anything he says, even though, as you've noted, they make it up. It's totally false. It has no basis in reality. So what can the press do or what can we do in conversation with some of those people to reach them and get them to actually accept the facts? Well, that's difficult. And I think there are many people who you cannot reach in that way. Let's take the, the, the people who believe in QAnon theories, which are, of course, absurd. Um, there's a significant chunk of the Republican Party that that is sympathetic to those views. There's nothing that people like you and me um, uh, can say that is going to uh, persuade them. However, I do think that over time, um, the, the people who believe many of those things are older, as those are replaced by a younger generation, you have uh, a little bit more elasticity in, in people's opinion and, and willingness to accept facts. When you see the legal process grind on. And, and Jill, you saw this morning again, another uh, of the defendants uh, in the Fonnie Willis case in Georgia uh, copped a plea and said, oh, I thought I was doing what was right, but I was misled by older lawyers. None of that, uh, ended up, she's the fourth in that case to cop a plea. None of those things individually are going to make people, oh, light bulb goes off. Hey, they were lying to me. But I think there's an accumulation of those things that over time uh, sobers a segment of the population that uh, might have been a little bit more cavalier in accepting 
lies that they were being fed. That's at least what I have to hope is true, because I, I, I think rational yeah. argument, you know, th there's a segment of people who will be influenced by rational argument and they'll weigh that against other things they want out of politics or, you know, who's going to cut my taxes or raise my taxes. And they'll factor those things in with the kind of scandal and the nastiness that they don't like. Um, but that's a relatively small group. Most people have chosen upsides that I think, uh, I think the biggest thing that changes is time and demographics. Of course, the press is covering both sides and <laughs> you think that's, fair or proper? Do you think that maybe we need to get to a point where we label things as fake news, made up news, lies, and then report the actual facts? Or do we have to keep covering or even just putting out what Donald Trump is saying as if it was all true? What should be done by the press in terms of as we go forward in the 2024 election? What should the press be doing? Well, I think I think the press has to cover both sides to the extent that there are legitimate sides on both um, uh, legitimate sides of, of differences of public policy and public affairs. If you know, and as a journalist, and you are compelled to make analytical judgments, if you know that something uh, that one side is saying is not true, you need to say that. And I think uh, to a significant degree, the press is beginning to do that, and certainly. The uh, January 6th and the reaction to uh, lies about the 2020 election have been a little bit of a break point because uh, you don't often see anymore stories in the mainstream press um, that that uh, suggest there's any merit to the idea that there was big election fraud. And the fact that uh, Fox News had to pay uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to Dominion voting systems and acknowledging that they were disseminating things that uh, weren't true. I think those are all uh, steps forward. I think as the legal process uh, grinds on, those are steps forward. Trump, I think, in terms of the things that he says, that's those are, uh, are difficult things. If he's going to be the nominee of the Republican Party, you have to cover things that he says. On the other hand, you have to be mindful of uh, things that are dangerous things that are libelous and defamatory to people. It, it's a little bit of the um, uh, conundrum that faces somebody like Judge Chutkin in the case that she's overseeing. And, you know, um, yes, there's a First Amendment right to free speech and Donald Trump is entitled to a presumption of innocence and all that. But there are some things that you can see that are um, uh, dangerous that someone would say, either dangerous to the uh, prospect of a fair trial or physically dangerous to people. You know, whether it's the judge or people who work for the judge or potential witnesses. And I think um, some discretion and judgment is called for by those of us in our business, just as it is in, uh, uh, as those of us who administer our system of justice. So let's turn to um, President Biden. And we know that you interviewed him for ProPublica mm -hmm. recently. We want, to, we want to get to that interview. Um, but first, you know, Jill and I, we often talk about how we consider some of the treatment from the press about President Biden to be unfair, either not covering his events mm -hmm. in, what, in the way that they did for Trump or talking about things like, I don't know, like what speakers he, sneakers he wears or focusing on his age incessantly. So I just want to ask you what you think of the coverage so far, and if you think it's a fair kind of assessment. I think the coverage of President Biden has been pretty bad um, in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, in one uh, respect, the coverage, I think, doesn't necessarily reflect the actual stakes in the election. So if, for example, you believe that uh, democracy is under threat, by Donald Trump and what he represents and the dishonesty and the um, uh, uh, conspiracy to try to overturn the will of the voters in 2020, if you really believe that those are the stakes, the, the coverage ought to reflect that and not necessarily be, well, Donald Trump is a liar who threatens democracy and Joe Biden's really old. Let's weigh those two things. Um, Joe Biden is really old. Uh, and that's a significant issue. But I think 
reminding voters uh, of the uh, stakes of the election and keeping them in proportion is something important. I think partly the coverage reflects the imperative that I mentioned before. That is, you have a right wing uh, media cheerleading squad that is full time lifting up um, the uh, the side that they want to vindicate and full time trying to tear down uh, the other side. And then you have a, a mainstream press, which is devoted to old, an older ethic of, well, let, let, let's uh, let's be um, uh, tough on this president uh, as we typically would. And I think the toughness sometimes gets translated into uh, coverage that trivializes what's actually happening. So, for example, Joe Biden, by all accounts, has done an expert job of rallying the coalition of free countries to support Ukraine against Russian aggression. He has, by all accounts, uh, done a very effective job in reacting to this recent horrific attack by Hamas on Israel and how the United States, considering all its foreign policy implications, is coping with that. The United States economy is doing extremely well um, by the standards of the rest of the world and by the standards of our recent history. Low unemployment, solid growth, um, increasing workforce participation, wages that in 2023 are now moving forward uh, in excess of inflation. All of those things um, are uh, uh, suggest that right now, whatever the implications of Joe Biden as he ages in his 80s, if he is reelected, he's doing the job effectively. To what degree is, does the coverage right now reflect that Joe Biden is doing an effective job as president? I think that's been often obscured by the fact that the yeah. press wants to balance, you know, Trump's defects with Biden's defects. Um, and, you know, you certainly have to cover his political vulnerabilities, but I think you also have to, um, as a fair minded uh, analyst of what's happening, reflect the, the reality of the job that he's doing as president. So you recently interviewed him for ProPublica. Mm -hmm. And before we run out of time, I definitely want to focus on that. And mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to come back to have a longer conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, talk about, first of all, how you ended up getting the interview and what you talked about, what policies did you talk about? What? Just tell us about it, because it was a great interview. Well, thank you. Uh, and I think the reason that I got it was for some of the uh, 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 provocations that I mentioned before. That is to say, um, I think the most important issue facing the country right now is the um, viability going forward of American democracy. I explicitly asked to talk about that. Um, and that is something that Joe Biden wants to talk about because he thinks, and I agree with him, that that is that is the sort of big backdrop to the 2024 election. And I think that um, by making the choice to talk about that, that to me was a way that I could, um, as an individual journalist who didn't happen to work for a particular news organization when I requested the, the, the interview, restore some of what I think is the proper perspective and proportionality to the coverage of Biden. So that he doesn't give many interviews. And so when he does one and you focus on the uh, threats of democracy, I, I felt good that um, I was advancing a conversation that is true and needed and important for the country to have and that it wasn't getting enough of. And we agree with you on both those issues that the country isn't getting enough of it and that it is essential at this inflection point in our history, where for the first time, you know, you read a book about how democracies die and you can believe it. Um, Absolutely you, know, you can. Yeah. And, and that all of us, every single person in this country needs to work, not just the journalists to communicate facts, but all of us need to be involved in understanding the realities and getting out the vote and making sure that we protect this precious thing that we have called democracy. And so you as a member of the press have a 
big job in front of you. And we're very grateful that you were able to join us today to talk about some of this. And we look forward to having you back again. Thanks, Jill. It was a pleasure. And Victor, thank you too. Jill, that was such a great episode. Um, But let's talk about some of the chaos that we're seeing right now um, in the House, which is I don't know, at least in my lifetime, it seems like there has never been this moment before. Um, but talk about whether or not you've ever seen this much kind of disarray and, and division um, and, and just chaos uh, in Congress since sort of your time. Not even in my lifetime um, have I seen <laughs> like this. And I, I think, you know, John pointed to something which is true, which is the Republican Party isn't a party anymore. It isn't a party with policies or a desire to govern. And it's that's what's going to take us down if we don't get a party in power. Um, And maybe there's two Republican parties, the few people who are part of the old GOP, which stood for grand old party. And then the right wing, I don't even know what to call them, they're more than MAGAs, they're more than the Freedom Caucus, who really just want chaos. They're happy to create the chaos. They don't care about governing. And so it makes me wonder, why do they want to stay in power unless they have a goal? And I I don't know exactly what it is, but it is very frightening to me to see this kind of chaos. And you know, while we were talking to John, um, we did get word that the Republicans have now selected Emmer as their possible speaker candidate. But while it seemed he was normal, you know, he hadn't voted to take down the election. It now turns out he actually did because he participated in an amicus brief. So even- Jill, if I can step in and, and, and say something, I mean, this sort of normalization of people like, uh, Tom Emmer and, and, and other Republicans who deny the election. Over the weekend, there were nine, at one point, nine Republicans running to be the speaker. And there was actually, a real, I think NBC or some outlet did an analysis of their vote record in terms of like democracy and protecting um, democracy. Let me just tell you, all nine of them voted against the establishment of the January 6th committee. Seven of the nine voted against the 2020 election results. The two who didn't, Tom Emmer and Austin Scott, actually voted uh, they signed on to the amicus brief urging the supreme court to overturn the election so all of them in some way just don't care about our democracy and who rejected the results of the 2020 election and that's what's frightening is that nine people ran to become the next speaker and all of them are not believers in democracy and free and fair elections and that's the type of people who they're nominating like there isn't even one person in there who will stand up and you know just say that the 2020 election was fair and you know that joe biden won you are completely right and you know it's such a low bar that you could say that well it's not as bad as jim jordan well that isn't (laughs) isn't acceptable to me to say he's not as bad as jim jordan when jordan is i i don't want to say on a a a show like this uh, exactly (laughs) what i think but i think everybody gets the point of how bad that would have been to have that person be second in line to the presidency, vice president, speaker of the house. That is terrifying because he is one who has really blatantly and openly tried to take down our government. And so Emmer is a little quieter maybe, but the end result is the same as you point out. He was part of uh, an amicus brief to overturn the election and everybody knows there was no fraud. I don't believe for yeah. a second that any member of the Republican Party actually believes that. I do not believe that. I, I think some voters may have been led down the primrose path by statements from Donald Trump and Jim Jordan and others, yeah. but I don't yeah. think that any of those speakers actually believes it. And that's terrifying. But right. I don't and that's such a negative. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because my favorite holiday is about to take place, and that is Halloween. And I I dress up even to open the door to trick-or-treaters. I wear a mask and sometimes a costume. 
I love costumes. I love Halloween decorations. I love Halloween candy. Uh, so tell me what your experience with Halloween is. Did you go trick-or-treating as a kid? I did go trick-or-treating as a kid. And we're going to have to show our audience that one. Um, I think I came across a photo of you in a Dalmatian outfit. Maybe it was last Halloween, but I searched it up on Twitter. And so oh, no. I do have it. And we'll include it in our show notes. I yes. mean, it's such a great outfit. I, and I actually, you know, until you told me about that, Jill, um, that Halloween was your favorite holiday, I did. I had no clue. I had no clue that you enjoyed Halloween that much. But yes, as a child, I did go trick-or-treating. Um, for anyone who doesn't know this, I love sweets and candy. And so it's a great excuse to, you know, get a lot of candy. And I can even say a lot of my friends here at college are planning trick-or-treating. Um, so college students are still doing it. I don't think you can ever be too old <laughs> to do it or to love Halloween. Um, I don't know what my outfit, though, is yet this year. Um, I don't know oh, what costume oh, it's going to be. Let's think about that and think about a good one for you. I, I tend yeah. toward nations. I even made a 50s felt skirt, a circle skirt. So anyone who's listening your age has no idea what I'm talking about. But when I was in high school, we used to wear these gigantic circle skirts with big, thick cinch belts, and they used to have poodles on them. But I bought felt and made a Dalmatian to put on my felt skirt. So, oh. I, and I still have that. I can take a picture and add it to our show notes. I still have a picture of it. Wow. It's just, I mean, it's not well made. I will certainly admit to that. Uh, my sewing skills are not like my sister's-in-law, uh, Kim <laughs> Kimberly Atkinstore, who is a very good designer and, and seamstress. Um, and she makes a lot of her clothes and sells clothes. She has her own line of clothing. Oh. Um, and, you know, I always, here's one of my big debates is, do I buy candy that I love so that if there's some left over, I will mm. enjoy eating it? Or do I buy stuff that I hate so that I won't be tempted to down the whole bag. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on the giving out end, but it's someday you'll, you're going to have that same debate. And I personally, I love Almond Joy. Do you, do you even know oh, what that old fashioned candy? I do. I yeah. do. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 love, I love that. And, and what's the one without the almonds? Um, it's the same coconut. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I like that a lot too. Uh, they're dark chocolate, yeah. which that one is dark chocolate. So I love that one just as much. Uh, my husband is a wow. and three musketeer person. He loves those. And um, oh. so I, I suspect I'll end up buying those brands so that we'll have leftovers that we like a lot. That'll be fun. And I love oh, seeing wonderful. the kids wow. come to my house. I love seeing um, it, it's really fun. <laughs> And I'm hoping we're not recording at the time because Brisby goes berserk <laughs> when the doorbell rings. And if the doorbell is <laughs> ringing for trick or treaters while we're recording, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be horrible. <laughs> It'll be funny. It'll be Brisby barking. And then the person who, who answers the door will also be dressed up as Brisby. <laughs> um, that'll be fun. I promise not to wear my Brisby outfit on the okay. show. Um, maybe not. Maybe, well, yeah. maybe. maybe. I mean, that, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. Um, well, let us know what your Halloween festivities are, um, what your outfit is going to be. Maybe I'll get some inspiration for that. But we thank you, everyone, for watching this episode of iGen Politics. We hope you'll subscribe right here on YouTube.com slash Politicon or follow us wherever you follow your podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, really wherever you get your podcasts. We are there at iGen Politics under the Politicon family of podcasts. Thank you so much for watching this episode, and we will see you next week. So Jill, we are back. Um, it has not been even a few hours. Um, and we are back because we previously said that uh, during the time of our recording that Tom Emmer had been elected to be the Republican speaker um, nominee. Uh, but that's changed. It certainly has, much to everyone's surprise. The third one is not the winner. He has withdrawn his nomination and they're back to square one. There are still two candidates left and there is also the speaker pro tem, B. 
being discussed as someone who could be given the full powers of the office for a temporary time period so that Congress would stop being completely unable to do anything. Because without a speaker, the only job that the president, uh, the speaker pro tem has is to elect a speaker. And they cannot take up any legislation. They cannot give aid to Israel. They cannot give aid to Ukraine. They cannot keep the government open. And it's going to close in a few weeks. So, sorry. You know what I find even more laughable about this? Not that anything about this is, should be laughable considering we're barreling toward a government shutdown. But I read that this Tom Emmer guy actually was the majority whip, which is so funny because anyone who understands the, the whip position knows that their responsibility is to count votes and to get enough <laughs> votes to uh, either pass legislation or, you know, and that in his case, keep Kevin McCarthy as speaker, but he couldn't even find enough votes. And uh, it's just so embarrassing, I feel like. It, it is definitely humiliating for the Republican Party and for democracy. We are now a laughing stock because of this uh, among our allies. How can they trust us when President Biden says, I will give aid to Israel. I will give aid to the Palestinians. I will give aid to Ukraine. And he can't because that requires that there be a functioning Congress. And, you know, Emmer is from Minnesota and I'm headed there next week. Um, I'll try and see what I can learn about him from my contacts at the University of Minnesota Law School. Yes, yes. But it, it should be very interesting, but it is just it's so it isn't funny. I mean, it, it is laughable or risible. My new favorite word. It's risible, but it is not. It is not funny. It just yeah. isn't. We need to get this done. And I think what this shows is that the Republicans do not care about governing. I don't know what they care about, but it isn't running the government. No. It is creating chaos. And it's it's just unbelievable that, oh, there's also talk, of course, that McCarthy could be brought back again. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's so silly. It is so silly. I don't know who they're going to end up with. I would not even place a $2 bet on <laughs> any of the two remaining candidates or any of the 400 possibilities in the world. I mean, well, yeah, you know, they have to be a congressman or yeah. woman. It could be, it, it could be a senator. It could be someone not in government. It could be, dare I say it? No, I won't. I won't. But you all know who I am. <laughs> No, no, no. Him. yes, yes, yes. Liz Cheney, Liz Cheney, that's yeah. who. Yeah, well, she'd get some Democratic. No, but it, yeah, no, it, it it is ridiculous, and we hate to have gone from a low note to a high note with Halloween back to a low note, but let's end back on a high note and say, if you have thought of your Halloween outfits, just let us know what it is. Um, I still have not decided one in the few hours, um, but I hopefully will have one by next week. Um, we thank Hold you for on. watching. I can go get my mask. Hold on one second. Oh. Pause the okay. recording for one second. I'll be right back. Here it comes. Brisby turns into Jill. Wow. What a way to end this episode. <laughs> Wow. The only thing we don't hear is- I take artwork. Halloween seriously. Yes, yes. And we can't wait to see your full outfit next week, Jill. So uh, that is that should be all the more reason for all of you to tune in next week for another episode of iGen Politics. We'll be back uh, with a great new guest. You don't want to miss it. Uh, be sure to follow us wherever you follow your podcast or on YouTube at youtube.com slash Politicon, where we release episodes every Wednesday. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And we'll be back next week where you'll see uh, Jill's great Halloween outfit in its entirety. Have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>